Good morning. Um, my name is Deborah Zielinski. I'm here to speak on the importance of a mind-eye connection in Alzheimer's disease. Um, I don't have any disclosures. How do I get to the? Don't have any disclosures. Um, the problem is that patients with Alzheimer's disease often have problems with mental confusion and with balance. And what I'm going to explain today is how these two main issues, balance and mental confusion, are linked with the eye and why there is an importance of a mind-eye connection for treating these patients. The hypothesis is that specific peripheral retinal receptors uh, change brain function when you stimulate them. And by doing that, you can improve balance and situational awareness. Using customized eyeglasses to selectively stimulate the retinal function in a population of only three patients with Alzheimer's disease benefited each of those patients significantly. That's not enough of a sample to make a formal conclusion, but the logic holds true and it's enough to warrant further research. So when you're wearing customized eyeglasses, the patients had less mental agitation, better physical orientation, and better mobility, and were much more comfortable with a calmer nervous system. Just as a recap, there's four different main types of eye care. Um, optometry, is that's what I am. It's, we examine eyes with an emphasis on function. There's ophthalmologists, uh, which, who examine eyes with an emphasis on structure. There are neuro-ophthalmologists uh, who identify conditions in the body that manifest in visual impairment. So a neuro-ophthalmologist can look at the eye and say, oh, you might have a lung problem or, or you might have colon cancer or you might have diabetes or you might have high blood pressure. So they can determine systemic conditions based on what they see in the eye, indicating there are pathways connecting the retina with the body. The issue is that since those pathways exist, why can't you use them the opposite way? And that's what neurooptometry is. Neurooptometry is using those same visual pathways, but altering the inputs to ch create physiological changes in the body. The eye is not isolated from the mind or the body. When signals come in the retina, they travel to many different places in the brain. The retina is not a camera as it used to be thought of. It's an actual interface between internal body systems and external sensory systems, sensory signaling. So as shown here, there's uh, neurological connections and then there's also chemistry going on, biochemistry. So there are different mind-eye pathways. As was already said, this is just a different type of view of the same information. When signals enter the eye, they travel to four main spots. How do you get this? One spot is for balance, which is where am I in space. One spot is for localization, which is where is an object in space. One spot is for the identification of what an object is. And another spot is for chemical regulation of the body of how am I. So those four are important. And what's interesting of those is that the balance pathway and the chemical regulation pathway are internal systems. And the where an object is and what an object is are external systems. And again, the retina is an interface between those external systems and internal systems. And when you change the retinal stimulation with glasses, then you're altering the interaction among all those systems. Most people use the peripheral eyesight and central eyesight as what they think of as vision. The central eyesight is the, that identification, the what is it, the 2020. Peripheral eyesight is the localization of where targets are, scanning. But the peripheral retina is used in three of those, um, three of those systems. The peripheral retinal stimulation affects chemical regulation, mental attention, balance, and everything. For instance, if you have a person who sees a mouse running across the floor, the external sig sensory signals of the mouse moving 
modulate internal body system responses. You will get a flow of adrenaline. You will get a, um, you will get muscle tension. You will get their mental attention shifting over to the mouse. And the internal body signals are going to modulate the retinal signals. It's a two-way street. So when this person perceives the mouse, not only is their attention zoomed onto the mouse and their muscles tense and the adrenaline running, but the peripheral retinal sensors shut down and they're only aware of the mouse. It's a tunnel vision effect and they're all of a sudden not aware of something else. But traditional eye examinations block peripheral eyesight. So even though the mouse was creating a moving shadow on the edge of the eye and it had such a severe visceral reaction, a traditional eye examination is not going to catch what does a moving shadow do on the periphery of the eye. It does check does peripheral vision exist, but it does not check whether it's interacting with central eyesight nor how the patient handles sudden changes, which is what everyday life is. So, more than 80% of the retinal sensors are located in the fovea, which is your 2020 eyesight, which is right here. So of the 63 million retinal ganglion axons, about 90% uh, of them or more than 80% are in that foveal region. But the, oops, but the rest of them, but the rest of them uh, are for the peripheral retinal stimulation. And of that periphery, as was said before, approximately 1 or 2% are the melanopsin-containing ganglion cells, which we'll see a little bit later. The point here is that the central eyesight, that 2020, is a really small spot. That's the spot that's tested on a regular examination, yet the peripheral is where all the action is. The overlooked impact of peripheral vision, again, something flies up out of, suddenly out of the corner of the eye, like the mouse that was moving. You have perceptual systems affected. You have chemical systems affected. Your blood pressure, your heart rate, your whole autonomic nervous system goes into sympathetic overload. Muscular systems are affected, and cognitive systems are affected. Now, here's a different view of the retina. The peripheral retinal signals affect much more than background awareness. So the horse represents a target. That would be your 2020 eyesight of where you're seeing something. That's your central eyesight, what you choose to aim and focus on. The grass in the background represents the peripheral eyesight. And so you have cones and rods that send you signals for the, the, to see the horse and the grass. But the ambient lighting, that's what's stimulating those melanopsin-containing ganglion cells. They're in a whole different layer than the rods and cones. Now the rods and cones, this picture is old and the research has proven it different. So they have found that the rods and the cones together send signals into the melanopsin containing ganglion cells. Um, so the picture is not quite drawn this, the way it should be. And then also there are cells internally from the thyroid function and chemicals and the superior, uh, the superior chiasmatic nucleus that send signals backwards into the retina, also into those melanopsin-containing cells. So those melanopsin-containing cells are sitting there receiving in mixed information from the rods and cones that has been filtered through many layers and receiving information from the body from that how am I pathway. So the melanopsin cells are getting the how am I information and they're getting the where is it and what is it information. And there's a lot going on. To go back to the concept of external and internal, the peripheral eyesight, peripheral awareness, affects physical orientation used in posture and gait. And it also, that these are um, head position and neck position and how it's connected with the eyes. And Alzheimer's disease, oops, also affects central eyesight and peripheral eyesight. I'm trying to, there, this one. I don't know how it came up. Uh, so there's this, these are the external systems, central and peripheral eyesight, as well as the previous ones, the neck and body positions. All of those are connected with the eye. And in papers you have that how am I, where am I, where is it, what is it, all, who am I. Those, but in the Alzheimer's patients I've seen, the per, when the peripheral and central eyesight is not balanced together, 
or if the neck and head position is not able to give good proprioceptive information, the patients get confused. And when the patients are confused, there's a problem. One of the examples you could use as far as peripheral and central eyesight is if you're looking at people's name tags at this SPMT convention, trying to read them with your central eyesight, but your peripheral eyesight is distracted by all of the things on the name badge, it takes a lot more energy and effort to find somebody's name. That's what Alzheimer's patients do every day, just looking for the door or a coat hanger. Okay. They don't know where to put their attention on blobs. Here's a classic picture from the 1950s, and it's just blobs. So an Alzheimer's patient would be looking at it saying, what is this, where is it, I don't know where to look. How many of you know what this is a picture of? One. Where do you look? It's a picture of an animal. So you can't tell what it is because you don't know where to look. This is how Alzheimer's patients are every day. What if I told you here's where to look, and there's an outline now. Can everybody see the animal that it is? There's a long face, two ears. That's a picture of a cow. And you can see the nose and the ears. Now I'm going back to the one where you didn't know what it was before. How many people here can see the picture of the cow now? All of you. Here's going back to the original one that you couldn't see. Now you can. All you have to know is where to aim your eyes. So in the retina, you have about 63 million receptors that get information and it's filtering out into 1.2 million exiting signals. Those signals split very fast into chemical systems and muscular systems, and they're f but the slow ones are for mental filtering for your eyesight. The chemical and muscles are unconscious reflexes, but then you get into subconscious responses of internal awareness and external awareness, attention, Aiming and focusing for an Alzheimer's patient is very, very hard because they don't know where to put their attention. This is a slide that shows a simplified version of the central nervous system, how the retina, which is over here, on the bottom toward the left, it's connected to muscular systems through the midbrain, the brainstem, and the spinal cord. It's connected to the thalamus for eyesight, and it's connected to chemical regulation. So you have the retinal hypothalamic tract, you have the retinal collicular tract, you have the retinal geniculate tract, but everything is all linked together. And when you put eyeglasses on, you're affecting it all. There's a gap that exists between neuroscience and eye care. All these neuroscientists are finding experimental data showing what's going on in the retina, showing what you can do to the retina, but the eye care is working with people navigating their way through space every day. Neurooptometry can bridge that gap. We need a collaboration of professionals looking at the interaction of these systems and designing customized eyeglasses can advance the research in Alzheimer's disease by using the eye as a portal into the brain. People know it's a portal into the brain, but they're not realizing that glasses can affect it even when you have 20-20 eyesight. There's so the conclusions are that customized eyeglasses can influence Alzheimer's symptoms by affecting brain functions and that inter internal external information. In my practice, when I've had the three patients we were talking about, they each have experienced ability to navigate and move and know where objects are instantly. A team approach is very helpful. The lenses have improved patients' balance, gait, their confidence during walking, and their entire quality of life, and their ability to judge where, where objects are. And the key point for you to remember to take home is that peripheral retina is important and very overlooked. I wanted to thank uh, Maya, Dr. Maya Coronio for inviting me here to speak today. And thank you.